Good day, Miriam. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me, Transatlantic over Skype. Yes, thank you, Guy, for the invite. Well, you're most welcome. For it our almost audience, feels like, like the, the what is it, the Hall of Fame kind of thing? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, that's so. Let's put some pressure on you here. Yeah. But for our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about first where you grew up and where you went to college and what you studied? Yes, of course. So I'm Miriam, uh, Miriam Nealon, and I am Dutch. I grew up in the Netherlands. I also went to college in the Netherlands. Uh, I studied in Groningen, which is still my favorite city. Uh, I started doing, I had, had an interesting sequence in, I did, I first did like a master's of arts in psycholinguistics. Uh, and then a bachelor's in speech therapy, because that was kind of like an agreement between these two um, colleges. Uh, then I worked as a speech therapist for a long time, and then I did uh, a master of science in the learning sciences, but that was through the Open University online. Thank you. Can you share with us uh, where you live now and, and where you work and what you do? I currently live in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, I work for Accenture uh, as a learning experience design lead with internal clients. Thank you. Can you share with us a little bit about your career progression uh, after being a speech therapist and how you then migrated and eventually got to Accenture? Yeah, so at some point I decided to, to quit my speech therapy uh, career and, and started studying uh, learning sciences and during that period, I did like multiple internships, uh, started in Mexico, um, then moved to Seattle um, and did some projects with the University of Washington as an instructional designer, uh, at T-Mobile as an instructional designer. That's where I also did my thesis on communities of practice. Um, I had a job after that as an instructional designer slash e-learning developer. Um, so I did a lot of e-learning development um, in my early uh, instructional design career. And then when I, uh, well, I, I kind of progressed then to more like a senior instructional design role. Then when I moved to Ireland, I started to take on more what I call holistic learning design roles. So more like lead roles where you think more you know, broader around what an overall learning experience should look like. And um, yeah, worked for Google for a while. And then uh, for a company called Learnovate Center, where I did a lot of applied research in the learning design space, which was really cool. I, I really loved that, you know, working with clients and getting a chance to do a lot of research based work. Uh, and then uh, applied for a job at Accenture because I just wanted to have more, like, corporate experience under my belt. So, you know, more complex environments. Well, that's a very uh, cool set of uh, careers and jobs that you've had. Uh, can you share with us any of the uh, maybe more interesting things that you've done and maybe go a little bit deeper in what they were all about? Yeah, so um, one of the things I found really interesting was when I did my thesis at T-Mobile, which was still early days, but it was interesting because it gave me an opportunity to apply the research in a real corporate environment. So they had like a, a platform where they try to encourage communities of practice. So I had a chance to, um, you know, do surveys with people and figure out, you know, why they behave the way they behave. And so my thesis was on lurking. So people who, who you know, uh, listen and read but don't contribute. Um, so I found that very interesting project. Um, other projects that I really enjoyed were at Google. I did a project around informal learning. So more trying to figure out how you can support that in an organization. Uh, at, yeah, I did a, oh yeah, one at a, a, a publisher where the for, for I work with like a group of stakeholders, they were editors, and for the first time they moved from paper-based stuff to digital stuff. So that was a really interesting project as well. I've done so many interesting projects. Um, one on Experience API, 
competence, assess, competencies assessment, feedback. Yeah, so plenty. plenty. Very, very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your new book? And if you have it handy, can you hold it up for us? Well, you know what? I have it handy. It's very <laughs> residential. Very good. Well, this is recently out less than a month ago, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. It came out the 3rd of February. So what can you share with us about what it's... I've read the book, but I'm going to let you uh, share with us uh, what it's all about and what your intent was, you and Paul, your co-author, uh, what you're intending to do with this book. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I couldn't have done it without Paul. Like, Paul is, you know, he has, like, such deep knowledge in so many different um, dimensions of, of learning and instructional design. Um, so the intent is, it is focused on, on the workplace, um, because that's my, my thing. Um, the intent is to help the profession mature, because I feel that we're still doing way too much based on what we believe, based on what we prefer, based on our gut feeling, uh, our preferences, and there is so much evidence out there, like scientific evidence. So the book is about scientific evidence. There's, of course, different types of evidence, but um, there is so much evidence out there that we can leverage. Uh, and that doesn't mean, you know, you use it and you never think about it again. You use it um, based on your experience, based on your context, and then you need to test and see if it works in your specific context. So the book explains a lot about, you know, why the profession is in the state that it is, why it needs to improve. It has a ton of examples um, uh, about, you know, to illustrate points, but also around how to do things better. I think it is a nice balance between more, it has the academic rigor, but it's also quite practical, I think. Would you agree? I would, I would agree, yes, thank you. And I would highly recommend people uh, follow up and... Uh, purchase and read this book. Uh, let's shift gears here a little bit. Uh, can you share with us uh, what your first exposure to what I call HPT, human performance technology, or evidence-based practices for performance improvement, or, or however you refer to it? When did you first come across this, and how do you refer to it? It depends. Performance improvement works well for me if it's still about a bigger picture. I use in evidence-informed learning design when it's about learning design and the reason I use evidence-informed and not evidence-based is because evidence-based is so grounded in medicine and it's it's mostly about uh, quantitative data and you know really the highest levels of evidence that we have and I think in our context we need to be a bit more cautious with the evidence that we have and you know, doing a good job of understanding what the level of evidence we're, we have. Um, yeah, so that's why I prefer evidence-informed over evidence-based. It's funny because the first time I actually, it was actually in my speech therapy career because it was, it was one of my biggest frustrations that at the time speech therapy wasn't very evidence-based and that was a big frustration for me. The, the one thing they did a good job of was with swallowing uh, disorders because they had like MRI videos just so people could really learn based on evidence. Um, and then, of course, later, the, fir the first time I uh, encountered it or worked with it was in, during my master's in learning sciences. Yeah. Well, thank you. Can you share with us... Uh, who were your biggest influences in evidence-informed learning or the broader evidence-informed uh, performance improvement, uh, people or articles or books, as a way to point our audience to some of these uh, resources? Yeah, so in my early days when I studied, it was definitely uh, the 4CID model from uh, Jeroen van Marienboer uh, and the book 10 Steps to Complex Learning from Paul, for, from Jeroen and, and Paul Kirchner uh, together. Um, that's still my Bible almost. I think there's so much in that book uh, that you can use and need to read over and over again <laughs> to remember it. Um, 
and later, oh wait, wait, like also in my in my studies, uh, the Dick and Carry uh, model. So what's it called again? Systematic, systematic design of instruction, I think. Still, I think a good model um, to use if after you've determined that you need a learning solution. <laughs> And then later, uh, Magar and Pipe for like the bigger, uh, the bigger picture uh, stuff, um, which was quite an eye opener. And also, uh, what are the authors? I wrote it down somewhere. Um, Brendel Klein and Hoffman on the cognitive task analysis uh, stuff. Really important book, I think. Um, yeah. So those were my early days. Uh huh. Thank you. If uh, let's uh, segue to, uh, I'm asking for an example of your 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do. And I typically set this up saying you're at a neighborhood party and there's somebody new to the neighborhood and they don't know you. And they come up and say, Miriam, what is it that you do? What's your short and sweet answer to that question? And then feel free to elaborate further as necessary. Yeah. So if I would be really at a, at a party, I would say something like, um, I do something in learning and training, you know, I focus on adults and I basically help people in organizations to do their jobs better. Um, that's what I would say. Um, if people want to know more, <laughs> which they usually don't, <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that I lead front to end learning design processes and that I'm responsible for like the the rigor and integrity of the design. And I work with, you know, many different people. It could be instructional designers. It could be people who know a lot about social learning. It could be people who know more about certification or performance support or, you know, whatever, e-learning. So, yeah. Thank you. My next question is about your current or next focus for learning. Uh, can you share with us anything that you're working on uh, for your own learning purposes as a lifelong learner? And then if it's a appropriate, any writing that you're doing about that. So where are you on your own lifelong learning uh, journey? Yeah, I am still trying to get my head around complex learning and complex skills. I think that is an immensely important topic in uh, the context of the workplace. Uh, I've written multiple articles uh, on it with, with Paul uh, for our blog, and it's also part of the book. But I still, uh, last week I attended a session from uh, Julie Dirksen. She did, uh, in London, she did a session on, on complex skills. And she had a slightly different lens. So I still feel I need to learn more. And I would like to create more examples for people because I think it's quite a difficult concept for people to grasp and what it means to design uh, for them. So that's something I, I'm thinking of and hope to read a bit more of research. You know, there's, I, I've already looked so like there are a lot of examples of case studies where people have tried to apply like the 4CID model, for example. So work a little bit more with that. Um, I also want to know more about self-directed and self-regulated learning because that's another part that I think is extremely important uh, for today's organizations. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, shifting gears once more, is there a favorite, uh, or perhaps it's not a favorite, performance improvement or learning term or phrase that you'd like to define for us? And I usually ask and set it up this way. Perhaps you feel that the the, the term or the phrase is, is being misused or it's being misconstrued, and here's your uh, shot at uh, putting your own spin on it and feel free to do more than one if you have uh, have more than one to share with us. Okay, I'll offer three, two to kind of nag about and one as like a, <laughs> a, a good example, like an important one. Um, so the nagging ones are, first of all, uh, the term course. Um, 
people are bashing the course uh, and then they interpret it as a lecturing, you know, a lecture style type of thing where the teacher explains a bunch of content to people and, and off they go. And to me, that just shows that people really don't understand what the training research tells us about what a course is, because a course really is originally a holistic learning experience, right? Where you can have all kinds of elements, including performance support, different types of performance support, but it should be focused on explaining concepts, practicing, getting feedback, going back to work, find the support you need in different ways. So that's a course. A course is a full-blown holistic learning program. So that's one. Two, I can't help myself. I need to mention it. Neuroscience. Mm -hmm. It drives me crazy. Um, I... I, I'm also a bit disappointed or sad almost because I think neuroscience is extremely uh, important and interesting and fascinating. But because people t start talking about it as if it's something that it's not, I don't know what to do with it anymore because I am interested in it. At the same time, I want to kind of dismiss it at this point because we shouldn't focus on it for our practice. Um, so yes, please feel free to follow it and, you know, learn from it and be fascinated by it. But for our practice, it's really not that important at this point in time. Um, even if people talk about things that are true, like sleep is important for, le for learning, you know, it helps us to consolidate memories. Yes. Okay. So what? Like that doesn't mean that much for our practice. Then there's a group of things that are really not true. For example, uh, when we do something really exciting in in a learning program, then dopamine is released and that way, and therefore people are motivated. That's just simply not true. Um, and there's a group of things that is not that harmful, but still a bit annoying, where people call things neuroscience, where it's actually not neuroscience, it's cognitive science or behavioral science or even social science sometimes. Um, yeah, so that's just a bit frustrating to me. The term that I would like to mention that I think is important is worked out examples. Uh, and the reason why it goes back to my fascination for the complex uh, skills and complex learning uh, bits is that I feel they're very underutilized. And in my experience, they are, and also when you look at the research, they're so effective and efficient. Um, so they're just so important when it's about teaching people how to carry out a task or how to solve a problem. And just to, to, to define it, right, it's about providing an example that is both product and process based. So it's about the what, but it's also about the rationale behind it. So for me, when I have used them in my designs, they, they not only give like really strong examples that people, you know, that help people understand, but they also provide you with this foundation that you can use throughout the rest of the learning experience as a hook to go back to over and over again. So it's almost the core of the overall experience. So, yeah, I, I am a big fan of work yes. <laughs> And you provide plenty in your new book as well. Yes. Well, thank you for those uh, examples. Uh, I think in the area of our language in the profession, we have a lot to work on. So we are opportunity rich, as the uh, joke goes. Um, so let's shift gears here. Now, my next question um, that I, sh I shared these questions with you in advance, but I'd like to explore with you some of the people who have influenced you. And I'm looking for either stories about them to humanize them and or um, just shout outs in terms of uh, uh, what you got from them. So you have a, a number of people that you're going to uh, uh, share with us. Uh, so please. 
Well, sorry, but I, I do need to start with Paul Kirchner because he is just my my mentor and my he always jokingly calls me his grasshopper. Um, but it's it's funny because people sometimes I well first of all I've only met Paul face to face uh, twice, and we've been working together for over four four years now. Uh, we have different versions around how we connect it. <laughs> <laughs> Memory, it's a tricky thing. Right, exactly. <laughs> so my version is um, that he always wrote really good blogs in Dutch, which is a bit ironic, right, because Paul is American originally, uh, has been living in the Netherlands for forever. And um, so I, in my, uh, my, my memory, I, t I tweeted him and I tweeted to him and I said, why are you not writing in English? Because your blogs need to be spread like they're so good. And he was like, I have no time. And then he said, do you want to translate them? And I thought, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but then I thought, hold on a second. If I start translating them and, and, and translate them to the workplace context, and then start writing my own stuff, and then he can give me feedback. I can learn a lot from this man, right? So we just decided to give it a go, and um, yeah, so we've been writing together for, for four years, and now the book. So, um, and he's, he's very nice and, you know, very critical as well, but I, yeah, I think that's super important. So that's one. Um, just a, a short, brief mention of Jeroen van Marienborg, just because of uh, the, his 4CID model and the, the book, 10 Steps, because to me, that is just one of the most important, you know, books available uh, for learning designers. Um, then in my earlier days, Clark and Meyer and the... Uh, What's the title again? Uh, e learning, um, e learning, and the science of instruction. So um, Ruth Clark, Ruth Clark, and and Richard Meyer. Yes. Right, right, right. So still, I think that book is it's so it has a lot of rigor, very practical, easy to use. I I think for people who do, who you know design e learning uh, stuff. Um. Then Clark Quinn has been part of my professional development path since the very beginning, uh, when I was still a novice, and you know he was. I I, I looked up to him, and I, I went to him just online. I I asked him questions, and he was always very nice. You know, responded, and um, then I met him once in Las Vegas when he was still doing like the M learning uh, stuff, which is I think about. I don't know, 10 years ago or something. Um, yeah, and then, you know, we're still uh, connected and he's still, you know, I, I go to him for advice or, or whatever. So, um, Wenger, uh, I don't know him personally, but Chen, Chen Wenger, um, I think has contributed to the field in a very different way, but I, I think his work on communities of practice uh, when I was working on my thesis and also after, I think it's really important work. Um, Airout, Michael Airout, um, who he's passed away, right? But a um, lot of important work on informal learning in the workplace. Um, Dick Clark, uh, I think I mean, Dick Clark has done like uh, so many great things for our field. Um, the reason I mention him in particular is because his, you know, his message that media will never uh, influence learning, that it's always about the design. Uh, I think that's really important, especially, you know, because our field has a tendency to jump on bandwagons and trends. And, you know, just if, if you keep that in mind, that it's never about the tool, never about the media, well, you don't have to worry about it. You, you just look at what works, right? Um Patty Shank is a dear friend of mine. I think she does great stuff. I don't really know how we became friends, but I don't know. I The first time we talked in person, we were friends. So um, I think her books are great. I think she contributes a lot to the field. Two more, then I'm done. Will Talheimer, great guy, does a lot of important research to practice work. 
Um, I think he deserves more, you know, credit and um, visibility. And then Julie Dirksen, uh, just because she knows quite a lot about a lot and she, you know, she's very nuanced and there's a lot of rigor to what she does. So I admire her a lot uh, as well. I met her for the first time in London last week in person, which was great. So yeah, a lot of great people. <laughs> Thank you for sharing uh, all of that with us. I, I, it's, a, it's a good segue here now as a wrap up to our interview. Um, I, I'm asking for any parting words of wisdom or guidance that you might share with our audience, especially those who are new to the field, whether they are younger or middle-aged or older. But what advice do you have for people entering into the field? I would like to ask everybody to think critically, not as a 21st century skill. <laughs> Uh, but to tease out stuff, so to really think about whatever you read or hear or see, um, what is the evidence that this is true? Um, how nuanced is this? What do I need to do to tease this out to really understand what to do with it and how, you know, to take, if I need to take it seriously or um, just keep looking, like don't just accept things because important people say it. Um, yeah, move away from following guru type of, you know, just look at people's quality of work and really look for quality. That would be my hope and advice. Well, thank you so much. Miriam, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insights with us in this interview. Um, I wish you a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Guy.